So welcome to the Space Quantum Cybersecurity Webinar conducted by Craft Prospect in collaboration with Cureka and Area Networks. I am Sonali Mahapatra. Uh, I work at Craft Prospect and the University of Strathclyde as a Space Quantum Technologies Developer and Researcher. I'll be your moderator today and will be leading today's session. Our world today turns out data at a very fast rate and it brings with it the added responsibility of making sure that this data is secure. With the maturing of quantum technologies such as quantum computers, current encryption technologies such as public key cryptography are vulnerable to attacks. And there arises the very real possibility that even though even the toughest security protocols would be cracked as early as in the next 10 to 15 years. But this quantum threat also brings with it its own set of solutions. Technologies such as quantum key distribution, quantum random number generators, quantum sensors, and so on are starting to be commercially available. However, commercial quantum encryption techniques today are point to point and are limited by their distance and the Earth's atmosphere on the ground. This is where we could really use space and satellites to carry on board QKD sources, QRNGs, which are quantum random number generators and other quantum technologies in order to form a worldwide constellation of satellites, which can boost quantum encryption and connectivity, thus making our encryption methods future-proof. At least that's a dream, and I think we're going towards it pretty well. With the advent of the new space age and the use of small satellites, such as CubeSats, there comes other added security challenges as well. The reliance of CubeSats on commercial off-the-shelf components and open source software can be uh, quite a double-edged sword. The lack of regulations around orbital spaces, as well as the new challenges that quantum encryption methods bring, have opened up vast challenges and opportunities together in this rapidly developing area. So how does the future look like? The future would realistically have some kind of a hybrid solution of classical and quantum encryption methods, relying heavily on space as an enabler for security. And today we have world experts from industry around the world who will be discussing with us the state of the art in these almost sci-fi-ish areas. So uh, without further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker, uh, Ian McOven. Ian is the managing director at Barrier Networks and has 20 years experience in the cybersecurity industry, which has been spent designing, delivering and auditing complex infrastructure across most industry spaces. His areas of expertise include secure system architecture, web application security and security testing to services. He has represented the UK as a SCADA security SME and as a CSIRT trainer in international cybersecurity simulation exercises and serves in the military as a cybersecurity officer. So Ian, welcome. Thanks, Anali. Um, so, so as you said, I'm the managing director at Barrier and at Barrier, um, you know, our kind of mission is to help organizations and our customers to say, stay secure from cyber attacks and to help them develop uh, cyber resilience within their organization and strategies which will help them stay secure. Um, most of that is done through building secure systems. And a big part of what we do and, and what I've done throughout my career is working in control system environments and SCADA type systems. Um, and, and that's really helped us with the work that we do with Craft because a lot of the components and technology that you, they're using uh, kind of links into that kind of control system type architecture. And that was how we ended up kind of building the partnership between uh, Craft and Barrier. Uh, Craft told us, you know, that about the, the very interesting and innovative work they were doing. And, um, and we're hoping to help Craft um, secure and, you know, build a, a secure by design system. So thank you for having us. I'm looking forward to today's discussion. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Ian. That was, uh, that was a good overview and uh, it was really illuminating to hear that. Our second speaker is Denise Ruffner. Denise Ruffner is Chief Business Officer at Cambridge uh, Quantum Computing and is responsible for all business development activities and building the company's growth agenda. Denise is also a senior advisor to OneQuantum.org, an organization devoted to creating a quantum startup community. Denise joined uh, CQC after an 18-year career at IBM, including developing and heading the IBM Q startup and ambassador programs. Denise. Hi, Sonali. Thank you so much for including me in this seminar with this great panel. Um, wanted to talk for just a minute about Cambridge Quantum Computing and what we're doing. Uh, we are a UK-based company out of London, and we're focused on two different things. The first being quantum software, and the second, where, where we work on solutions ranging from chemistry to optimization and finance. 
And then the second area is the development of certifiable and proven quantum random number generation. So it fits into this discussion beautifully. Our approach for quantum random number generation is a protocol and it's based on generating quantum random numbers or entropy on a quantum computer. Um, we've just completed beta testing. We have shown commercially viable output rates and commercially viable delivery mechanisms. And we are in the process of rolling this out as, as a solution. And our initial work has been on the IBM quantum computer, but we are working with um, other vendors as well to roll out the solution. Thank you. Thank you so much, Denise. That was really exciting. Our third speaker is Steve Greenland. Steve is a managing director at Craft Prospect. Uh, it's a space startup we founded three years ago to bring new emerging uh, artificial intelligence and quantum technologies into the space domain. The company's strategy uh, is to deliver products and services targeting a new wave of smart, secure space assets and has now grown to an interdisciplinary team of 15. Previous to establishing Craft Prospect, Steve was a senior system engineer at Flightspace and led the development of the company's and Scotland's very first satellite, UCube One, in 2014. In addition to satisfying Craft Prospect's first customers and partners to understand and use AI and quantum technologies for space, the company has its own first in-orbit demonstration mission, part funded by UK space agency uh, known as ROX, as a service demonstrator for new responsive operations and augmenting quantum key distribution. Steve. Thanks, Sonali. And hi, everyone. So as Sonali says, I am Steve Greenland. Um, I'm a systems engineer, space systems engineer by training, um, but founded Craft Prospect in 2017. The proposition for Craft is that Really, it's an extension of what has fueled the first growth in very small satellites or CubeSats in the early 2000s. At that time, we, we saw the application of miniaturized consumer electronics applied in intelligent ways to deliver small satellites, meeting standardized interfaces. Now we're looking to bring more emerging and consumer technologies into the space domain to push these small satellite capabilities still further. Quantum technologies can provide a step change in the applications accessible and services offered by these systems. And onboard AI and autonomy allows us to reduce the operational costs for delivery. Our company kind of uh, approached cybersecurity through, through almost a side channel uh, with its work with both the onboard AI and quantum technologies. It's interesting that in both domains, cybersecurity plays an important role in adoption but in different ways. For AI, then it's a requirement where we are reliant on decision-making and on the basis of these intelligent syst systems. And therefore we must ensure that these products haven't been tampered with in any way. But with quantum technologies, it's both a requirement and also an application. Technologies like single photon emitters and receivers, quantum random number generators, they allow us to build a component library, which we can use then to support next generation secure services. And given the global and scalable medium space provides, it allows us to roll out these uh, services globally uh, via space. For our first mission, ROX, um, then we're looking at combining both the AI and quantum technologies for future security related applications. We'll be using the onboard AI to understand the availability and security of links with ground nodes and the quantum technology to perform quantum key distribution and related services. This allows us to deliver these building blocks for space systems in AI, autonomy, and quantum tech. And it will allow us to demonstrate new quantum secured uh, cybersecurity services working in consortium with a range of verticals outside of the space industry. The need for enhanced cybersecurity spans across our data-driven market verticals. For QKD in particular, domains where information is highly valuable or maintains its value are both of interest. The latter is probably the larger driver now, given the amount of data that can be captured and stored for later processing. How can we be sure that these current encryption methods will retain their security 10 or 100 years into the future? And that's the sort of problem that Craft is looking to address. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. A very interesting overview. It's very nice to see all the technology coming together slowly. Last but not the least speaker of the day is Rob Campbell. Uh, Rob is a blockchain solution architect, adjunct, profess adjunct professor, independent distributed ledger researcher, and a PhD student. Um, BSI, uh, sorry, <laughs> can I be excused for just one second? Uh, I would love Rob to please uh, continue with your uh, talk, and I'll be back to introduce you properly in some time. <laughs> oh, sure. 
story, yeah. Um, yes, I work at BSI Solutions uh, located in Charlotte, which is the headquarters. Uh, we are currently engaged in building a quantum enabled blockchain. And uh, so that's uh, pretty exciting to me. And uh, there's a lot of things we can do with the quantum technology with respect to quantum random number generators for start, and then the uh, quantum key distribution. So those are uh, technologies that we're going to be employing for a customer here in, in the US. Um, I've uh, spacecraft, let's see. I'll start with cryptography. I've been uh, working cryptography, military grade, since the 80s, uh, spacecraft uh, since the 90s, uh, electronics, uh, and some other kinds of things. So um, I think it's great. Uh, it's a great time now because I'm seeing a convergence of technology coming together. Like, for example, the blockchain, where there are technologies that have been around for, for decades, but all of a sudden they're put together in one way and we got a new technology. So it's very, very exciting times for me. And uh, yes, I'm a PhD student. I will be awarded my PhD in quantum uh, technologies, quantum resistant technologies in the fall. So I'll be done um, this fall. That'll be great. That's it. Thank you so much, Rob. Um... Sorry about the interruption. It's interesting to see the real world coming in to uh, interrupt with our webinars. Uh, makes us remember that we are still in the real world. Um, I would like to add to Rob's uh, talk a little bit to say that um, additionally, uh, so Rob is a senior cryptologist, cybersecurity specialist, and healthcare certified information technologist. Additionally, Rob holds the following degrees and certifications, bachelor's degree in electronic engineering technology, space systems engineering professional code. He's a former naval cryptologist with over 30 years of experience in the Department of Defense and the Intelligence. Community. And he's passionate about quantum physics. Rob, did you want to add something more to your talk? Oh, uh, no, you just cut out for a brief moment. No, I, I think that's, that's good. It covers everything. Thank you so much. Um, all right, this has been really great. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been a wonderful overview of various different approach, approaches and technologies currently progressing around the world. We will now throw open the panel discussion. We would love for the audience to participate heavily. So please do make use of the ask a question section, the tab on your right-hand side to send us your questions and to fuel this discussion. But in order to uh, start the discussion right now, I'd like to uh, kick it open with a few questions of my own. Um, the questions are kind of open to everyone um, and anyone who wants to jump in can, are very welcome to do so. So my first question is, what are the immediate dangers to cybersecurity? Uh, right. <laughs> you want to address that? Go ahead. Denise? Okay, well, oh, I'll, sure. I'll... okay, okay. I wasn't sure who she was calling on. Um, I, I think there's a number quantum computing um, will be able to hack today's current encryption standards. And I think one of the immediate dangers, and maybe it's not immediate, but people can store encrypted data, and down the road decrypt that data. And so I think um, it's a concern for all of us now to start uh, bridging over to looking at how we can protect our data um, using quantum means as opposed to uh, looking at just today's standards. I, I like to add uh, on to Denise's uh, statement if I could. Um, yeah, so um, there's a couple of things. Uh, the way we, that we look at quantum computing threat generally has been considered to be a uh, universal fault tolerant computer, right? Which is low low error rates and that sort of thing. That's the kind of thing that we have to watch out for. That's that's one aspect. Another aspect is that the only discussions that we're having is uh, the progress that's reported in in the public in the commercial industry. But we have to be cognizant of the fact that 
governments around the world have been working on quantum computers for decades, and they're not going to let you know what their capabilities are. So in my mind, the threat is now and not in the distant future. Another one, one last thing on this. Uh, so I talked about fault tolerant universal computers. There's another type of quantum computer that uh, people didn't think would be a threat. And those are the annealing type of computers, like quantum annealing, like D-Wave as an example, they build them. Uh, and these types of computers are minim they're, they're great for minimization problems and fixing traffic. But uh, researchers have found a way that they can factor uh, numbers to, to break cryptography as well. So those computers are out and there are 5,000 quantum bit computers that have been sold recently. So Rob, I have a question for you. Um, you talk about fault tolerant. Um, don't you feel that there's also a threat from the NISC quantum computers? Yes. Um, NISC? Um, NISQ. NISQ, noisy intermediate oh. scale quantum computers. Uh, well, I, I, well, perhaps, but I, I do, I do know about quantum annealing, and I do know about traditional fault tolerant, the universal, what they call the universal commercial computers. So um, I'm not familiar with that. That's okay. But I do know, you know, about the, the others. Can you tell us about it, perhaps, quickly? So today's current um, quantum computers are considered NISC or noisy intermediate scale quantum computers. And they are um, a bridge on the, on the evolution to developing what we call a fault tolerant quantum computer, which is kind of the holy grail. So um, what, what I'm saying is I think that today's quantum computers are evolving, um, even though they're not fault tolerant, but they will have the capability to break current encryption. So I don't think we have to wait for a fault tolerant computer to come along. I think that today's quantum computers, which are evolving quite rapidly, um, will be able to break the current standards. Do you, do you have anything to um, add to it as well? Sorry, say That's again. To me, Sonali? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think, you know, the, the quantum element's been covered, you know, about the immediate kind of dangers of cybersecurity. Um, you know, I would say probably that there are many, many challenges within cybersecurity and the biggest one for us or for me is the unknown aspect of it. One day we can be in a position of security and then the next, you know, a new, a new vulnerability can be discovered and your system can be compromised because of that. And um, so I think for me, the most important danger and the wider cybersecurity uh, issue is probably having good um, detection and response capability. So making sure that these quantum systems that we're building and designing, you know, have layered measures of security in place that allow us to detect, you know, if there's any attempt to compromise or breach. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I would agree with what the, um, Rob and Denise said to, with, with regards to the quantum aspects. Thank you so much, Ian. Uh, maybe I'll move to the next question. Sure, uh, we'll, be have, we'll be having lots of questions on this as well. Uh, soon. But the next question is on the space side. It's from Thomas Varga from the audience. Uh, satellites are used for QKD. Is it a requirement that the satellites don't know the keys generated? Uh, says that, for example, MyCS knows the keys. Uh, if yes, if it's a requirement that the satellite don't know the keys, how can this be safely achieved? Maybe Steve, you want to take that first? Yeah, so there's, uh, there's a few different methods that keys can be delivered within, within quantum key distribution. And some rely on the satellite being a trusted node within the network. And that is that you trust that that, that system is secure and others as untrusted nodes. We're not there yet in terms of the, the solution for the untrusted node. Um, and so in the near term, then yes, you do need to be able to trust the satellite itself um, in the delivery of this service. In the future, we might see uh, systems like entanglement being qualified up front with uh, customers or clients adding their own additional um, obscuration and security into the satellite before launching so that a, a truly secure system can be implemented. Yeah, thank you so much, Steve. I mean, uh, what you said about the uh, satellites being a trusted node, I guess that also makes it even more important that we uh, talk about satellite encryption and how to make them 
uh, secure from any kind of hackable threats. That brings us to the next question from uh, Sashwat uh, Bharadwaj. Sashwat Bharadwaj. Um, there has been a demonstrable, demonstrable threat from NISC systems. Has there been a demonstrable threat from NISC systems to current encryption? Maybe Denise or um, Rob would like to take that again. Denise? Uh, you're muted, Denise. Rob, I'll give this to you first this time. Oh, no, go ahead. Um, since you brought it up, that's, go ahead. Okay. Um, can you refresh me on the question on? Sure. Uh, so the question is, has there been a demonstrable threat from NISC systems to current encryption? So that's a that's a tough question. Um, and and I would probably say no, that the NISC systems are still too small. Um, but there are some recent advances in NISC systems, I think that we're going to be announced over the next couple months. And we're going to have to wait and see whether that is the step and gives us the capabilities that it can really be a threat. But, you know, when quantum computing started, everybody always comes up with this five to 10 year number, like this is five to 10 years out, it's going to happen in five to 10 years. And that number has been there for 10 years or it, and so I think always kind of pushing it out is not doing justice to the development of the technology. And I feel that the threat of the NISC devices and the threat of quantum computers being able to hack current standards is much closer than the five to 10 year mark. Thank you so much, Denise. Um, sure. Does anyone else want to add something to that? Maybe Rob? Sure. Yeah, th there's another aspect um, to this, um, in addition to the quantum threat, is that the current cryptography system takes years to implement. And uh, so when the uh, threat is officially announced, uh, most people are not going to, organizations are not going to have all of the years uh, they need to transition to post-quantum or quantum uh, encryption. So uh, it's a planning uh, effort that needs to be going on now. How are you going to address uh, protecting your data when it is just public public knowledge that these computers can break your encryption? And so it's not something that can be done overnight. And I will say many of the leading corporations are actually working with us on their evaluation of our technologies. And I know they're working with other companies too, because everybody is starting to really think ahead because as Rob said, it does take time to implement these solutions. And so the time to start is now, even though, even though the threat is not around the corner, but given the length of time to evaluate solutions and implement solutions, um, the bigger companies, the bigger data firms, the banks, are all looking at quantum and are looking at how they can adopt uh, quantum type security measures. That's definitely true, Denise. Um, especially the evaluation and the certification, maybe in the future is going to be even more important because we might receive a black box saying that this is quantum secure algorithms, but how do we actually know what's inside of it, right? Uh, there was a question from the audience from Ankit Kumar Mishra. Uh, it's a broader one. How does Space quantum plays a vital role in cybersecurity, and how is that safely stored? I guess maybe we take the first part of it. How does space quantum plays a vital role in cybersecurity? Um, maybe Ian and Steve. Maybe Steve, you want to take it first? Sure, I can. I can start off. Um, so we have uh, the need to communicate globally, um, and we are communicating across networks, which which may span many different countries, um, maybe under third party control. Um, and so the need to be able to secure these, these fragmented networks um, globally kind of helps to drive the need for a, a space-based solution as part of an overall network, not, not the only method for delivering keys, but part of the, the overall solution where you've got nodes which might be located on other sides of the planet. And the second part of the question was, You're on mute, Sonali. Yeah, thank you. 
the second part of the question uh, says that how can we store them safely? I guess the question is how do we store keys generated by quantum technologies safely and also make quantum technologies safe from hackers? Probably let Ian answer that some more. Yeah, I, I that's a ground term so. problem. So many of the kind of security and mitigation techniques that apply to space-based systems uh, scenario also apply to traditional cybersecurity requirements. So first of all, ensuring that you build security into your design rather than retrofitting would be the first major step toward mitigating you know, you know, your cyber risk. And in the space and uh, satellite domain, there aren't really that many kind of definitive or the, the standards that you must adopt. So making sure that you have a good standard to follow um, and utilizing things like um, hardware security modules for storing keys, you know, proven technologies that can be applied as part of a space-based security system. So there's lots of technology out there that can be adopted and brought into your design for your space-based system. And then just making sure that you augment those technolo technologies into the space-based and quantum element in a secure fashion. Thank you so much, Ian. Uh, that, was, that was good. I think this also brings us to the next question. Uh, when Mio Yu asks, what distinguishing requirements are there for QRNGs for use in space QKD compared to other use cases? So if anyone wants to take it, you can raise your hand and I'll just, yeah, maybe Steve. Uh, you're muted, Steve. So, so we've been looking at um, the need to fly uh, QRNGs or at least validate them within the, the test uh, environment. And, and that's for a number of reasons. Um, we need to know that the, the QRNG remains and retains its randomness um, across the operational domain. Um, and and that, that then leads us on to the second kind of problem with space itself, which is how do we know that it continues to maintain um, its randomness once it's up there? Um, and so we, we've been looking at various different techniques which are more portable, um, where we can provide some real-time assurance um, on board the satellite. And I'll, I'll probably stop there because I know that Denise has some other solutions. So. Mm -hmm. You're muted. I, 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 was, I, was, I was interested to hear what you're talking about. So thank you. Um, our solution is um, right now generated from a quantum computer. So I don't see quantum computers flying around in space yet. Um, <laughs> so um, probably um, what I'm thinking is, I, you know, I don't know, we send up a huge packet of quantum random numbers to space or we do kind of achieve the result a little differently. Um, but right now we are tied to a quantum computer. Rob, um, do you have something yeah, to add? I have something. Um, so if we're talking about QKD, so we're really talking about establishment of quantum keys um, that are independently established between two parties. And um, a quantum key is not susceptible to the compute power of a quantum computer. Uh, a quantum key is based on quantum mechanics, not computational power such as the standard cryptography that we have. So we have a whole different uh, issue here. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, yeah, I mean, I think in the future, we will definitely be using a combination of uh, public key cryptography and quantum uh, key distribution and other quantum, other encryption methods may be post quantum as well. So it's really important that if we do use a symmetric key methods that are already there, they rely pretty heavily on having very secure random numbers and QRNGs are definitely uh, high up there on the, on the priority of having um, these technologies mature pretty fast. Uh, our next question is from uh, Michelle Krelina. Uh, she says, uh, they say, hi, I read one report for DOD where one of the recommendations was not to invest in the development of QKD technology, only observe it since there are other more applicable classical enough security systems. Could you comment? Uh, just, because, just before we start talking about this, maybe it's easier if all of us unmute our uh, microphones for the panel discussion now, it'll allow more organic discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe Steve, you wanna uh, uh, kick this one off? So I'll, I'll refresh um, the question. Um, they say that one of the recommendations uh, in a report for DOD 
was not to invest in the development of QKD technology, only to observe it, since there are other more applicable classical enough security systems. So I'm, I'm aware of some reports which, which especially early on, um, were a little dismissive, I would say, of, of QKD as, or, or, or uh, quantum security um, with the emergence of, of other techniques, post-quantum cryptography, for example. Um, we've seen that view softening with the, with the demonstration of uh, capability um, within, within China, with Mycius, um, but also within, within Europe as well. Um, and, and so I don't, I don't know the details of the, the exact document that's being referred to here. Um, I would say that from a UK perspective, then the, the advice from uh, NTSC has, has changed recently. Um, and, and so, yeah, it, it's looking more favorable towards the adoption of, of QKD as part of a, a wider uh, cybersecurity solution, not, not the sole uh, solution. You want to add to that, Ian? Uh, I don't think there's much to add to that, in all honesty, Sonali. Thank you. Denise, did you, did you want to add something? Uh, no, I, I, I agree. I'd love to see that report and what the date of the report is. I'm not familiar with it, and I try to really look out for that type of literature. So send it on through, and we'd love to take a look at it. Thank you. Um, our next question uh, from Rabin Swosti. Uh, is uh, a little, little different in the education sector. So if someone wants to get into quantum cryptography and QKD research, do we need to do our PhD in physics? Can a, can a computer science major get into the field? Uh, to answer your questions, Rabins, maybe I can take that. Uh, Kureka um, is creating online courses and you can feel free to get in touch with them. And uh, more, uh, more immediately, you do not need a PhD in physics. Uh, a computer science major can definitely get into the field computer science. Um, the capabilities are very much in demand in, uh, in, in any kind of cybersecurity field and any kind of QKD research or cryptography field. So uh, please do, and uh, I wish you all the best in the future. Our next question is by George Dunlop. Given the, lifetime, given the life cycle of a satellite, how do you ensure the ongoing resilience of the hardware years ahead of quantum fully emerging? We'll mm -hmm. Maybe Steve, you wanna kick it off and uh, we can have a discussion around it. So I think that's through having a, a robust um, testing campaign, both on the ground prior to launch, and then once it's in orbit um, through service demonstration, having having an, uh, a system where you've got third party experts who are able then to, to come in and test and validate each part of the system, because you are really only as strong as, as your weakest link. And, and the, especially for us with, with CubeSat systems, traditionally they're not seen as particularly secure systems. And therefore, um, we, we need to open ourselves up for uh, scrutiny and, and through just uh, testing. Another uh, technique that I've seen in the spacecraft industry is um, a lot of the, the, what would be traditionally called hardware would be in software. And so that the software could be changed in orbit. Mm. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. I think ongoing resilience is definitely something uh, that is very important. A lot of machine learning techniques nowadays and neural networks are being deployed to look into this. Um, at Craft, we have, been, uh, we have been using this for some other purposes, but uh, we will be looking at that in the future, hopefully. Uh, Denise and Ian, did you have something to add regarding uh, ongoing resilience of hardware years ahead of quantum fully emerging? Yeah, no, the satellite aspect of what we do is sits with craft prospect. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so our next question is from Gopal K. Mahadevan. Uh, Gopal asks, what impact will NISC systems have on the security of blockchain? Oh, I, I can, don't, yeah, I, I can yeah. get in. Um, <clears throat> so, um, you know, public key cryptography is uh, probably the most prolific uh, type of cryptography used in blockchain today. Uh, based on it's based on public key infrastructure (PKI). So you're talking about elliptical curves um, that are based on um, discrete log problems. And so quantum computers can, you know, when they're up to the task, very easily solve that type of problem. 
so uh, the the impact is such that uh, the blockchain implementers and owners are going to have to um, be modular enough to substitute um, cryptography that's considered to be post-quantum resistant. As an example, NIST uh, has an international uh, program and an international call that I'm involved in uh, where we're receiving algorithms from around the world and we're testing them and validating them. But they are not the type of cryptography that you can plug and play. Uh, their characteristics are such that modifications have to be made. But in your infrastructure, especially with blockchain, the blockchain has to be modular enough to be able to accept those things. Yeah, thank you so much, Rob. I think modularity is a big uh, factor in most of the future generation technologies that we are building because we're not sure where we are going to be use them in the future. So we have to make sure that they're modular enough so that we can swap out one, one part of this to some new technology that's coming up in the future uh, and so on. Um, the next question uh, is from Aditya Yadav. It's about quantum protocols. Uh, what are some of the top quantum protocols for multi-party communications? Most protocols people talk about are for point-to-point -point QKD communications. Any thoughts? Maybe, Denise, you want to kick that one off? Actually, I don't have an answer to this. I'd love to hear the answer. I'm wondering if uh, Steve has the answer. We don't have a a specific solution at the moment, but we, we're involved in, in various research programs to develop um, some sort of multicast system um, that would be relevant to, to satellites, um, the ability to be able to, to potentially um, share keys with more than, more than the two terminals may be of use for specific scenarios, um, noting that that might also be, make you more likely to compromise security. Um, so it, it's an area of active research. I don't yet have an answer for, for what that solution or what that protocol looks like, um, but we're, we're certainly speaking to people who are, who are looking at it. Thank you so much, Steve. And the next question is from Simon Hewitt. And that the QKD demonstrations with satellites has been uh, from very high altitude to minimize the amount of atmosphere on the single path for the uplink. What are the constraints on uplink? Will it be possible for uplink from sea level ground stations, or is there a fundamental limit that constrains the QKD uplink? So um, losses on on QKD links are in the in the first instance um, not not equal in uplink and downlink. Um, so uplink, you you tend to be passing through the more more dense atmosphere uh, first of all. Um, which leads to, to overall greater losses in your link, whereas in the, in the downlink scenario, you're passing for the majority of the time uh, through uh, the, the uh, less dense atmosphere. Um, so yes, it is possible to communicate down to, to ground level uh, terminals. The, the challenge is, is one of quite often cloud cover and other, other atmospherics which are, which are uh, absorbing the, the photons. Um, and that's something that, that we're looking at uh, addressing through, through characterization of the links in different areas, um, use of multiple uh, terminals within a local area to, to get to the keys uh, to that particular location, and then some onboard intelligence to start making good decisions about where to try and target uh, the key delivery systems. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, Joshua Anthony uh, has a question directed to Rob. Uh, Rob, so regarding innovations within quantum DLT or blockchain, blockchain ecosystems, shall distributed networks of entangled nodes mirror current development within decentralized node ecosystems? I'm sorry, I, I have trouble hearing you. Uh, I'll repeat that again, no problem. Uh, the question is by Joshua Anthony. Uh, Joshua, regarding innovations within quantum DLT or blockchain ecosystems, Shall distributed networks of entangled nodes mirror current development within decentralized node ecosystems? I'm sorry. I, 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 could you rephrase it in a different way? I don't understand the question. Um, yeah, let me try and do that. So the question is regarding the quantum uh, DLT and the blockchain ecosystems. And Joshua is asking uh, whether distributed networks of entangled nodes um, 
So I'm not sure what exactly entangled nodes uh, mean here, Joshua, but are they going to be mirroring whatever developments we have currently within a decentralized node ecosystem? So I'm wondering if there's, if by decentralized nodes, he means that the nodes are in various places around the world and they're not in a single place, but are all in a particular area. Does that make sense? Or maybe I'll ask uh, Joshua to reword his question and come back to us. Uh, well, okay, let me, let me try to uh, address it. Um, so we're talking about in blockchain, uh, the developments of how we would use quantum technology. So um, right, right now, uh, you know, pretty much uh, the organizations that are using uh, blockchain in the enterprise are closed systems. And uh, there are techniques that we can use to enable uh, quantum technology by using some, some innovative techniques as an example. Um, the noise, the random noise in the channels uh, in the data layer, sometimes used for quantum encryption because you need a, a, random, a random source. But even though that's not a, what we call a truly random source. So I've seen that. I've seen um, chi development, QKD. We're doing quantum chi distribution of developing that technology. And we're using quantum number random, random QRNGs. But uh, I don't understand the part about the entangled nodes. I'm not familiar with that. I don't know anything about that. But uh, the blockchain is really um, is prime for quantum technology, and um, so that's I, I see that as a, a, a growth area. Thank you so much, uh, Rob. Uh, for the audience, if uh, by any chance we are leaving out some questions or your questions are not answered, do not worry; they'll be sent to the speakers, and you will be getting a response. Um, so. With this, I would like to move on to a few more questions. So this is a question from my side. I'm very interested to hear. So in your, in your personal experiences, what has been the most sophisticated cybersecurity attacks uh, and threats that you have seen? So I'm a big fan. Of, uh, I'm a big fan of Dmitry Maslov, I think is his name. Um, or Vadim, oh, I, Boy, did I script the name, Vadim Makarov in Russia. I'm sorry, Vadim, um, but he uh, actually went from University of Waterloo to Moscow and does a lot of time, spends a lot of time trying to hack things. And I'm a big fan of looking at his website and seeing what he's up to. So yeah. I, I'm always um, interested to see what he's thinking up and uh, how he's progressing. Oh, that's awesome. I didn't know, oh, I have, I'm a fan alumni, I should check out Adam's work. That'd be great. <laughs> I, I would echo that. Um, yeah, the, the different the different kind of threat vectors that he comes up with for, for evaluating the quantum systems is, is incredibly valuable for the whole community. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I, I do um, digital forensics as well as part of um, uh, attacks, cyber attacks. And so I have to uh, get down to the ones and zeros to be able to go to court and testify. So what, one, uh, the last um, effort I was on, I found that it was a party uh, in Asia uh, that uh, hacked a party in Europe that hacked uh, the US and they created uh, a DDoS attack, controlling uh, computers through intermediaries. And, they were uh, in the system for over a year before they decided to go into ransomware, but they had exfiltrated data for going through various intermediaries. Um, so I thought that was pretty sophisticated. Yeah, I think Sonali, probably one of the, the, the more interesting ones I've seen is where um, a hacker was trying to compromise the IT network and uh, the IT network controls were very robust and they couldn't gain access. So they, they ended up attacking the building management system and the control system that sits within the building management system, um, taking over the, the IP CCTV and then using redirecting the cameras so that they could watch keystrokes from the IT network and then using the credentials that they had stolen off of the, the IP CCTV to access the main IT network is probably, probably one of the most innovative that I've seen out there. Oh, wow. 
Nice. <laughs> well, not nice for the the company being hacked, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, the sec next question for uh, from Alfonso Tello is similar. He says, can you comment on different strategies for hacking a satellite with, with current technologies or near future ones? Okay, um, I can start that off a little bit. Um, so there's a few, few different um, kind of threat vectors that we can consider. The space itself um, is, is obviously that there's a large air gap or, or vacuum gap between ourselves and the assets, um, but it does provide quite a, a noiseless uh, background environment, which then can provide um, some opportunities to, to listen into the internal workings of the, the satellite. Um, and as we know from kind of studies on the ground, this can, this can allow you to reconstruct um, an understanding of what's going on in the system. Um, with the emergence of uh, thrusters, miniaturized thrusters and smaller space assets, then there's, there's additional kind of threat around proximity. Um, to, to your space assets. And this is again where, where kind of quantum technologies and AI might collide. Um, and of course, the, the link itself, the, the, the data links down to the ground, they need to be incredibly robust because there's no way of kind of getting back onto the satellite and physically um, changing any master keys once they become compromised. And um, does anyone else wants to add to that a little bit more? Yeah, I think the uh, command and control telemetry links are easy targets uh, if they're not uh, uh, shored up. Yeah, um, I think that uh, recently I was in a space bar panel um, and they were actually talking about the companies now that if you actually want to hack a satellite and to know how a vulnerable how, how vulnerable a satellite is, you actually go and hack one and figure out what are the weakest points. So if you're interested, uh, just check them out. I think there's, be, there's going to be lots of interesting ones there. Uh, the next question is from Aditya Yadav and is for Denise. Uh, what is the benefit of generating random numbers using $15 million quantum computers rather than using a $2,000 single photon source to generate them locally and privately anywhere they are needed? Wow, that's a, that's a deep question and it's hard to give a short answer to that. Um, but I, you know, I will say that um, the random numbers that we are generating off of quantum computers, um, we are verifying with a Bell test and have extremely good Bell test values to verify that it is indeed truly random. And so I would position that as a much higher quality uh, random number um, than from a single photon source. But I'm sure we could have a two hour discussion about this topic. And so I, uh, you know, I, I, I just, I think there's many different approaches and each approach will have its own benefits. Um, so I, I just want to say that. Thank you. You also have to have high throughput, uh, sustained high throughput quality random numbers generated uh, for sufficient networks. That would be pretty Agreed. tough to do with a a single full time. Agreed. Uh, the next question kind of also follows this one. So, uh, but not in a technical sense, how many QRNG companies with commercial products or MVPs do you think exist in the world now? Any comments on different approaches? So I'm um, lead a, with, along with a gentleman named Andre Koenig, I lead a group called One Quantum and it's an association for startups, any startups in the quantum world. And uh, we're growing in membership, but we've done a lot of work in analyzing the number of startups focused on quantum. And one of the segments is around quantum security, and cybersecurity. And we predict that there's about 50 companies around the world that are doing this kind of work. Um, and it's hard to break it down and to say they all have commercial products or whatever. But I will say that it is an intense area of interest and focus, and there's a lot of development with different approaches going on. And it's only going to get more competitive and intense, I guess. So the bottom line is, if you want to get in the game, get in there now. <laughs> exactly. I agree with you. I agree. We've The startup um, ecosystem was 10 companies at the beginning of 2018. And now the entire startup ecosystem for the quantum is... 300 and about 330 companies. 
So you can see that in the space of what, two and a half years, it's just, you know, mushroomed yes. and it's gonna get even bigger. Thank you so much, Denise, for giving a number to that. That's really interesting. Um, there's another question for the entire panel. In conjunction with, uh, so given that there will be eventually different SQDs, so small quantum devices and larger quantum devices on the market within public and private sectors, how will qubit size or quality asymmetry be solved? For example, both einstein condensate device network interoperation with an optical lattice device networks. Maybe the, um, yeah, does anyone want to comment on that? I'm not sure about the last part. Uh, uh, can't comment on the, the, the both einstein condensates, but I, I can talk a little bit about kind of standards and alignment um, steps that we've been taking. So um, through, through engagement with, with groups such as Etsy, then we're starting to see um, at least the discussion of kind of interoperability standards. What, what those will look like? Well, it, it's likely that, that some of the larger players in the industry will, will really help drive these standards um, and, and essentially um, produce near complete versions, which, which other people will, will then have to, to align towards. Um, whether or not there, there will be kind of a completely open standard or whether it will be something which, which has uh, some proprietary features. Um, that's, that's still very much a, an open question and, and one that as a company involved in this field, then we're watching closely because it's a, it's a business risk. Yeah, thank you so much, Steve. And thanks for the question, Joshua, that was interesting. If you also wanted to talk more about it, uh, you can always write to info at craftprospect.com or send us an email uh, anywhere. Uh, on Kureka as well. That'd be great. Um, I will move on to the next question um, by Wen Miao Yu again. So uh, they say, it's really encouraging to hear that uh, CQCs, QRNGs are ready for commercial deployment, such as uh, with Intel. Apart from QKD, what do you all see as the most promising applications of QRNGs to be? Why are they needed? Is the certification feature really necessary? Maybe, uh, Denise, you want to... Should I answer? Should I answer? Yeah. I, I, okay. <laughs> Sorry, right. I'm waiting to so, see that. Um, so thank you for the question. It's a good question. Um, do I see, where do I see the most promising applications to be? Um, you know, we're seeing the most interest right now from large corporates that, um, you know, financial institutions that are really looking to secure their data and feel that they're most prone to hacking and attacks. So we're trying to follow, we're, we're actually following um, a lot of companies that have uh, quantum kind of innovation centers and are doing evaluations on different um, quantum keys and different uh, ways to protect their data. So, I see right now the initial applications through the large corporates. Um, and the certification feature is important because we do want to show that this is truly a random number generated. So it's something that we feel is really important. And actually, um, it's not really what we think, it's what our customers are asking for. So people are asking for independent validation that the numbers that we are handing over are truly quantum and that we're verifying it by bell test. And uh, if I could add, Denise, think um, the rationale for the, the true um, random number generator is that it applies to the cryptography that we have. So the public key cryptography, the cryptography we use on the internet, uh, the cryptography we use in sector enterprise, uh, start, the process starts with a, what's supposed to be a, a random number. If that number is not truly random, it's predictable. And that's most of the systems today. They, they don't have random number generators. They're not truly random. They're, they use like uh, different techniques they call them pseudo-random. If it's pseudo-random, then your system is going to be much, much more vulnerable. And I will be able to predict what, what that number was. And then I will be able to calculate and I can break that algorithm. So with a quantum uh, number generator, it's truly random from quantum physics. It's guaranteed to be random. Thank you so much, Rob. Yeah, that um, that was really interesting. So uh, one more question from my side. Uh, what kind of 
uh, legal challenges are we looking at in the intersection of space, quantum, and cybersecurity? Because as, as most of you have said, we are very much in the early stage of rolling out these technologies. And I think there will come a crucial point, some kind of threshold where we would need to make regulations around it. So where are we now? And how's that looking like, that landscape? And then we can have an open discussion. Steve, do you wanna say something about this one? Or Ian, maybe? <laughs> Probably Steve for this one. It's not really my idea. <laughs> <laughs> legal legal Sorry, Steve. challenges. Um, hmm. Well, it's not something that I know particularly anything about in terms of uh, quantum quantum systems themselves being subject to to some sort of legal challenge. It, you've provided me with a with a random number generator and it's not proved to be random to the level that, that you, you said so. And, and a way that a business will protect itself against that is to comply with standards and to ensure that it's tested up to a level that is internationally agreed. Um, so, so that would be a, a partial answer, um, but I, I think I'm probably dodging the question a little bit. I guess maybe we can talk about testing side of things. So we need new tests for the new technologies that are coming up, right? So I guess I meant that more rather than any kind of, you know, court of law thing. Denise and Rob, do you, uh, Rob, maybe you have, uh, yeah, go on. Anybody's <laughs> welcome to talk about uh, I, I, don't do, I, I don't do legal. <laughs> <laughs> so I think one of the things we're looking at is uh, export technology or export regulations, whether there's any restrictions if we, generate a quantum random number in a certain country, whether we can export it and whether there's any laws governing that. And that's something that we're looking into right now. So there, there is, um, I, I think that governments will start to influence um, how this technology is used and where it's used. And so that's something that we all have to consider all these 50 startups or all these startups that are looking at these products, we have to look at it. Yeah, I think that's right it, now it's really, point. yeah, mm. right now it's really a uh, big on the international collaboration space, and I hope that that does stay open. Um, virtual mm. take. I'll take one, uh, two last questions because we're almost there at the end of the webinar. Um, Robin uh, Pusher is a PhD student working on electrically driven, linearly polarized single photon emitters. Is it valid to use quantum cryptography as a motivation, or are we still far away from using single photons on a commercial base? Sure, uh, both Denise and Steve uh, would have something to say about that. Oh, these are good, tough questions. So I'm going to say, yeah. Steve, you answer it. Oh. <laughs> Again, thank you. <laughs> I, we, 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 we approximate at the moment um, with, with uh, weak hair and pulse systems for, for uh, the, the type of um, QKD that we're looking at using the, the BB84 uh, decoy state. So do, do we, is there, is there a use case for, for, for uh, truly single photon emitters? Then, then yes. Um, are we still far away from using those on a commercial basis? Probably a little bit further, um, given that everything is, is uh, a little bit far, far away from kind of real commercial um, utilization. Um, Just jump on that quickly and say that uh, there are a few companies that are looking at single photon uh, yeah. and uh, yeah, hopefully you'll be there. Is. So you should definitely, uh, yeah, use that as motivation for, you know, uh, electrically driven linearly polarized single photon emitters. Um, to take the next question very quickly, uh, Professor Dr. Hamid Dai Kasmai asks, quantum cybersecurity is non-hackable? I would say yes. Unless anyone wants to challenge me here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I <laughs> like to jump in. I, I get this all the time. I started out in blockchain, and uh, when during the hype, they said blockchain couldn't be hacked. That's because they didn't understand how it worked. Um, they, they're not seeing that anymore. And it's the same with quantum uh, uh, cryptography. Um, there are papers being written all the time in different types of attacks. There are many, many, many types of attacks. There has never been a technology that has it, it's not hackable. We don't have one today. We won't have one in the future. No thing, such thing exists. If it's designed, we designed it, there's a way to defeat it. There's a counter mission. 
Yeah, I, I would echo those comments, Sonali. I think that where there may be uh, an, an, indivi an individual part of, of technology that's, that's you know, unhackable, the application of the technology or the way it's designed or constructed or put together as part of a wider system often introduces vulnerabilities, which end up meaning that, you know, there are some, way, some ways of compromising it. So I don't think we're at the point yet where we can say anything is unhackable. That's a good point, Ian. Good point. Yeah, um, so we are almost at the close of the webinar. Thank you so much, all the speakers, for uh, agreeing to be on the panel and for all the interesting insights. Uh, thank you, the audience, for coming and joining us in the webinar and for all the interesting discussions, the questions that led to all the interesting discussions. Uh, you would all be receiving a link to a YouTube recording uh, so that if anyone wants to replay it and watch it, uh, you will be able to. Uh, regarding uh, Cureka, uh, Ex they expect to roll out uh, MOOCs, online training courses, and it will be ready around this autumn, around September. Uh, this is uh, with regards to the question from Gopal. Uh, thank you so much again. I would ask the speakers to close uh, with a one line each uh, to wrap up the session. Uh, maybe we can start with Rob. Yeah, uh, plan now the script and the cryptography. You, you, it takes a lot of time, a lot of planning, so do it now. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, Denise? Um, everybody, these were great questions and we really appreciate your um, attention paid to this panel. Feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn if I can get you any more information. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Denise. Ian, did you have, uh, do you wanna jump in and say something? Yeah, thanks for everyone for dialing in. If you have any questions regarding some of the cybersecurity elements of QKD or the application of it, feel free to reach out direct or via um, Craft Prospect. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Ian. And last but not the least, Steve. Uh, yeah, just to, just to echo, thanks for all the excellent questions. Um, really put me on the spot. Um, as a company, we're still on our cybersecurity journey, um, building trusted relations, because I think that there will be a time when this isn't just a a need for top tier solutions, but it's going to be ubiquitous and required. So, so now's the time to start. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, so I, we, we will close the webinar right now, but before I go, uh, I would ask everyone to check out the link to the survey right below the webinar. Uh, we will be having a follow on workshop. And if you're interested, please do fill out the uh, survey and we will reach back to you. Thank you so much. Uh, hope you all have a great rest of the day. Bye. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much.